Hickory Death by Agatha Christie Audiobook 10x11 He raised her head, felt for the pulse, then delicately let the head resume its former position. He rose to his feet, his face grim and set. No. Said Nigel, his voice high and unnatural. No. 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 Yes, Mr. Chapman. She's dead. No, no. Not Pat. Dear stupid Pat. How with this? It was a simple, quickly improvised weapon. A marble paperweight slipped into a woolen sock. Struck on the back of the head. A very efficacious weapon. If it's any consolation to you, Mr. Chapman, I don't think she even knew what happened to her. Nigel sat down shakily on the bed. He how with this? It was a simple, quickly improvised weapon. A marble paperweight slipped into a woolen sock. Struck on the back of the head. A very efficacious weapon. If it's any consolation to you, Mr. Chapman, I don't think she even knew what happened to her. Nigel sat down shakily on the bed. He suddenly he began to cry. He cried like a child with abandon and without self-consciousness. Sharp was continuing his reconstruction. It was someone she knew quite well. Someone who picked up a sock and just slipped the paperweight into it. Do you recognize the paperweight, Mr. Chapman? He rolled the sock back so as to display it. Nigel, still weeping, looked. Pat always had it on her desk. A lion of Lusm. He buried his face in his hands. Pat oh, Pat. What shall I do without you? Suddenly he sat upright, flinging back his untidy fair hair. I'll kill whoever did this. I'll kill him. Murdering swine. Gently, Mr. Chapman. Yes, yes, I know how you feel. A brutal piece of work. Pat never harmed anybody. Speaking soothingly, Inspector Sharp got him out of the room. Then he went back himself into the bedroom. He stooped over the dead girl. Very gently he detached something from between her fingers. Geronimo, perspiration running down his forehead, turned frightened dark eyes from one's face to the other. I see nothing. I hear nothing, I tell you. I do not know anything at all. I am with Maria in kitchen. I put the minestrone on, I grate the cheese sharp interrupted the catalogue. Nobody's accusing you. We just want to get sometimes quite clear. Who was in and out of the house the last hour? I do not know. How should I know? But you can see very clearly from the kitchen window who goes in and out, can't you? Perhaps, yes. Then just tell us. They come in and out all the time at this hour of the day. Who was in the house from 6 o'clock until 6.35 when we arrived? Everybody except Mr. Nijit and Mrs. Hubbard and Miss Hophouse. When did they go out? Mrs. Hubbard she go out before tea time, she has not come back yet. I go on. Mr. Nigel goes out about half an hour ago, just before six look very upset. He come back with you just now was that's right, yes. Miss Valerie, she goes out just at six o'clock. Time signal, pip, pip, pip. Dressed for cocktails, very smart. She's still out. And everybody else is here. Yes, sir. All here. Sharp looked down at his notebook. The time of Patricia's call was noted there. E.I. lit minutes past six, exactly. Everybody else was here, in the house. Nobody came back during that time. Only Miss Sally. 
she been down to pillar box with letter and come back in was do you know what time she came in? Geronimo frowned. Everybody else was here, in the house? Nobody came back during that time. Only Miss Sally. She been down to pillar box with letter and come back in was do you know what time she came in? Geronimo frowned. Because when sport come we switch off. Sharp smiled grimly. It was a wide field. Only Nigel Chapman, Valerie Hobhouse, and M.R.S. Hubbard could be excluded. It would mean long and exhaustive questioning. Who had been in the common room, who had left it? And when? Who could vouch for whom? Add to that, that many of the students, especially the Asiatic and African ones, were constitutionally vague about times, and the task was no enviable one. But it would have to be done. In MRS. Hubbard's room the atmosphere was unhappy. MRS. Hubbard herself, still in her outdoor things, her nice round face strained and anxious, sat on the sofa. Sharp and Sergeant Cobb at a small table. I think she telephoned from in here, said Sharp. Around about 6 CCJH several people left or entered the common room, or so they say and nobody saw or noticed or heard the hall telephone being used. Of course, their times aren't reliable, half these people never seem to look at a clock. But I think that anyway she'd come in here if she wanted to telephone the police station. You were out, MRS. Hubbard, but I don't suppose you lock your door. MRS. Hubbard shook her head. MRS. Nicolides always did, but I never do well then, Patricia Lane comes in here to telephone, all agog with what she's remembered. Then, whilst she was talking, the door opened and somebody looked in or came in. Patricia stalled and hung up. Was that because she recognized the intruder as the person whose name she was just about to say? Or was it just a general precaution? Might be either. I incline myself to the first supposition. MRS. Hubbard nodded emphatically. Whoever it was may have followed her here, perhaps listened outside the door. Then came in to stop Pat from going on. And then was Sharp's face darkened. That person went back to Patricia's room with her, talking quite normally and easily. Perhaps Patricia taxed her with removing the bicarbonate, and perhaps the other gave a plausible explanation. MRS. Hubbard said sharply, Why do you say her? Funny thing a pronoun. When we found the body, Nigel Chapman said, I'll kill whoever did this. I'll kill him. Him, you notice. Nigel Chapman clearly believed the murder was done by a man. It may be because he associated the idea of violence with a man. It may be that he's got some particular suspicion pointing to a man, to some particular man. If the latter, we must find out his reasons for thinking so. But speaking for myself, I plump for a woman. Why? Just tills. Somebody went into Patricia's room with her someone with whom she felt quite at home. That points to another girl. The men don't go to the girls' bedroom floors unless it's for some special reason. That's right, isn't it, MRS? Hubbard. Yes. It's not exactly a hard and fast rule, but it's fairly generally observed. The other side of the house is cut off from this side, except on the ground floor. Taking it that the conversation earlier between Nigel and Pat was overheard, it would in all probability be a woman who overheard it. Yes, I see what you mean. And some of the girls seem to spend half their time here listening at keyholes. She flushed and added apologetically, that's rather too harsh. Actually, although these houses are solidly built, they've been cut up and partitioned, and all the new work is flimsy as anything, like paper. You can't help hearing through it. Flushed and added apologetically, 
that's rather too harsh. Actually, although these houses are solidly built, they've been cut up and partitioned, and all the new work is flimsy as anything, like paper. You can't help hearing through it. The French girl heard the end of the conversation, Sally Finch was present earlier on, before she went out to post her letter. But the fact that those two girls were there automatically excludes anybody else having been able to snoop, except for a very short period. Always with the exception of Elizabeth Johnston who could have heard everything through the partition wall if she'd been in her bedroom, but it seems to be fairly clear that she was already in the common room when Sally Finch went out to the post. She did not remain in the common room all the time. No, she went upstairs again at some period to fetch a book she had forgotten. As usual, nobody can say when. It might have been any of them, said MRS. Hubsy, hard helplessly. As far as their statements go, yes but we've got a little extra evidence. He took a small folded paper passist out of his pocket. Sharp smiled. Kona hates that. Demanded MRS. Hubbard. A couple of hairs I took them from between Patricia Lane's fingers. You mean that was there was a tap on the door. Come in, said the inspector. The door opened to admit MR. Akai Bombo. He was smiling broadly, all over his black face. Please, he said. Inspector Sharp said impatiently, Yes, Mr. E. R. Earn, what is it? I think, please, I have statement to make. Of first class importance to elucidation of sad and tragic occurrence. Now, Mr. Akai Bombo, said Inspector Sharp, resignedly, let's hear, please, what all this is about. Mr. Akai Bombo had been provided with a chair. He sat facing the others who were all looking at him with keen attention. Thank you. I begin now. Yes, please. Well, it is, you see, that sometimes I have the disquieting sensations in my stomach. Sick to my stomach. That is what Miss Sally calls it. But I am not, you see, actually sick. I do not, that is, vomit. Inspector Sharp restrained himself with difficulty while these medical details were elaborated. Were elaborated. Sergeant Cobb leaned forward with an astonished face. MRS. Hubbard said obscurely, Rasputin, was you swallowed a teaspoonful of morphia? Naturally, I think it is bicarbonate. Yes, yes. What I can't understand is why you're sitting here now. And then, afterwards, I was ill, but really ill. Not just the fullness. Pain, bad pain in my stomach. I can't make out why you're not dead. Rasputin, said MRS. Hubbard. They used to give him poison again and again, lots of it, and it didn't kill him. MR. Akai Bombo was continuing. So then, next day, when I am better, I take the bottle and the tiny bit of powder that is left in it to a chemist and I say please tell me, what is this I have taken, that has made me feel so bad? Yes. And he says come back later, and when I do, he says, Aisha no wonder. This is not the bicarbonate. It is the borosique. The acid bore seek. You can put it in the eyes, yes, but if you swallow a teaspoonful it makes you ill. Borasic. The inspector stared at him stupefied. But how did Borasic get into that bottle? What happened to the morphia? He groaned, of all the Havre cases. And I have been thinking, please, went on a Kaibombo. The inspector groaned again. You have been thinking, he said. And what have you been thinking? I have been thinking of Miss Celia and how she died, and that someone, after she was dead, 
must have come into her room and left there the empty morphia bottle and the little piece of paper that say she killed herself was a Kaibombo post and the inspector nodded. And so I say who could have done that? And I think if it is one of the girls it will be easy, but if a man not so easy, because he would have to go downstairs in our house and up the other stairs and someone me Iyailat wake up and hear him or see him. So I think again, and I say, suppose it is someone in our house, but in the next room to Miss Celia's only she is in this house, you understand? Outside his window is a balcony and outside hers is a balcony, too and she will sleep with her window open because that is hygienic practice. So if he is big and strong and athletic he could jump across. The room next to Celia's in the other house, said MRS. Hubbard. Let me see, that's Nigel's and end. Len Battison's, said the inspector. His finger touched the folded paper in his hand. Len Battison. He is very nice. Yes, said M.R. Very nice, yes, said M.R. I have helped you, yes. M.R. Akaibombo asked politely. Yes, indeed, we're most grateful to you. Don't Turcom repeat any of this. No, sir. I will be most careful. M.R. A Kaibombo bowed politely to all and left the room. Len Battison, said MRS. Hubbard in a distressed voice. Oh. No. Sharp looked at her. You don't want it to be Len Battison. I've got fond of that boy. He's got a temper, I know, but he's always seemed so nice. That's been said about a lot of criminals, said Sharp. Gently he unfolded his little paper packet. M.R.S. Hubbard obeyed his gesture and leaned forward to look. On the hood paper were two red short curly hairs. Oh. Dear, said M.R.S. Hubbard. Yes, said Sharp reflectively. In my experience a murderer usually makes at least one mistake. But I.T. is beautiful, my friend said Hercule Poirot with admiration. So clear so beautifully clear. You sound as if you were talking about soup, grumbled the inspector. It may be consumed to you comb to me there's a good deal of thick mock turtle about it, still. Not now. Everything fits in in its appointed place. Even these. As he had done to MRS. Hubbard. Inspector Sharp produced his exhibit of two red hairs. Poirot's answer was almost in the same words as Sharp had used. Ah yeg, he said. What do you call it on the radio? The one deliberate mistake. The eyes of the two men met. No one, said Hercule Poirot, is as clever as they think they are. Inspector Sharp was greatly tempted to say. Not even Hercule Poirot. But he restrained himself. Konia for the other, my friend, it is all fixed. Allies, the balloon goes up tomorrow. You go yourself. Aishino, I'm scheduled to appear at 26 Hickory Road. Cobb will be in charge. We will wish him good luck. Gravely, Hercule Poirot raised his glass. It contained Krabmita menthe. Inspector Sharp raised his whiskey glass. Here's hoping, he said. They do think up things, these places, said Sergeant Cobb. They do think up things, these places, said Sergeant Cobb. Detective Constable McRae gave a snort of deep disapproval. Blasphemy, I call it. Sabrina Fair, that's Milton, that is. Well. Milton isn't the Bible, my lad. You'll not deny that Paradise Lost is about Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and all the devils of hell and if that's not religion, what is? Sergeant Cobb did not enter on these controversial matters. He marched Ishment, the Dewar constable at his heels. 
In the shell pink interior of Sabrina Fair the sergeant and his satellite looked as out of place as the traditional bull in a china shop. An exquisite creature in delicate salmon pink swam up to them, her feet hardly seeming to touch the floor. Sergeant Cobb said, Good morning, madam, and produced his credentials. The lovely creature withdrew in a flutter. An equally lovely but slightly older creature appeared. She intum gave way to a superb and resplendent duchess whose blue-gray hair and smooth cheeks set age and wrinkles at naught. Appraising steel-gray eyes met the steady gaze of Sergeant Cobb. This is most unusual, said the duchess severely. Please come this way. She led him Beth Ruff a square salon with a center table where magazines and periodicals were heaped carelessly. Around the walls were curtained recesses where glimpses could be obtained of recumbent women supine under the ministrant hands of pink-robed priestesses. The Duchess led the police officers into a small business-like apartment with a big roll-top desk, severe chairs, and no softening of the harsh northern light. I am MRS. Lucas, the proprietress of this establishment, she said. My partner, Miss Hophouse, is not here today. No, madam, said Sergeant Cobb, to whom this was no news. Dis, this search warrant of yours seems to be most high-handed, said MRS. Lucas. This is Miss Hophouse's private office. I sincerely hope that it will not be necessary for you to upset our clients in any way. I don't think you need to worry unduly on that score, said Cobb. What we're after isn't likely to be in the public rooms. He waited politely until she unwillingly withdrew. Then he looked round Valerie Hobhouse's office. The narrow window gave a view of the back premises of other Mayfair firms. The walls were panelled in pale grey and there were two good Persian rugs on the floor. His eyes went from the small wall safe to the big desk. Won't be in the safe, said Cobb. Too obvious. A quarter of an hour later, the safe and the drawers of the desk had yielded up their secrets. Looks like it's maybe a mare's nest, said McRae who was by nature both gloomy and disapproving. We're only beginning, said Cobb. Having emptied the drawers of their contents and arranged the latter neatly in piles, he now proceeded to take the drawers out and turn them upside down. Take the drawers out and turn them upside down. Here we are, my lad, he said. Fastened to the underneath side of the bottom drawer with adhesive tape were a half dozen small dark blue books with gilt lettering. Passports, said Syria I.E. and Cobb. Issued by Her Majesty's Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, God bless his trusting heart. McRae bent over with interest as Cobb opened the passports and compared the affixed photographs. Hardly think it was the same woman, would you? said McRae. The passports were those of M.R.S. Da Silva, Miss Irene French, M.R.S. Olga Cohn, Miss Nina L.E. Messurier, M.R.S. Gladwis Thomas, and Miss Moira O. A. Chenille. They represented a dark young woman whose age varied between 25 and 40. It's the different hairdo every time that does it, said Cobb. Pompadour, curls, straight out, page boy Bob, etc. She's done something to her nose for Olga Cohn, plumpers in her cheeks for MRS. Thomas. Here are two more foreign passports Madame Mahmoudi, Algerian. Sheila Donovan, Aira. I'll say she's got bank accounts in all these dilirent names. Bit complicated, isn't that? It has to be complicated, my lad. Inland revenue. Always snooping around asking embarrassing questions. It's not so difficult to make money by smuggling goods comb its hell and all to account for money when you've got it. I bet this little gambling club in Mayfair was started by the lady for just that reason. Winning money by gambling is about the only thing an income tax inspector can't cheek up on. A good part of the loot, I should say, 
is each to round in Algerian and French banks and in ERA. The whole thing's a thoroughly well thought out business like setup. And then, one day, she must have had one of I the fake passports lying about at Hickory Road and that poor little devil Siegia saw it. IT was a clever idea of Miss Hobhouse's, said Inspector Sharp. His voice was indulgent, almost f etherly. He shuffled the passports from one hand to the other like a man dealing cards. Complicated thing, finance, he said. We've had a busy time herring round from one bank to the other. She covered her tracks well her financial tracks, I mean. I'd say that in a couple of years' time she could have cleared out, gone abroad and lived happily ever after, as they say, on ill-gotten gains. It wasn't a big show illicit diamonds, sapphires, etc., coming INSTOLAN stuff going out and narcotics on the side, as you might say. Thoroughly well organized. She went abroad under her own and under different names, but never too often, and the actual smuggling was always done, unknowingly, by someone else. She had agents abroad who saw to the exchange of rucksacks at the right moment. Yes, it was a clever idea. And we've got Mr. Poirot here to thank for putting us onto it. It was smart of her, too to Suya Egist that psychological stealing stunt to poor little Miss Austin. You were wise to that almost at once, weren't you, M. Poirot? Poirot smiled in a deprecating manner and MRS. Hubbard looked admiringly at him. The conversation was strictly off the record in MRS. Hubbard's sitting room. Greed was her undoing, said M.R. Poirot. She was tempted by that fine diamond in Patricia Lane's ring. It was foolish of her because it suggested at once that she was used to handling precious stones that business of prizing the diamond out and replacing it with a zircon. Yes, that certainly gave me ideas about Valerie Hobhouse. She was clever, though, when I taxed her with inspiring Celia, she admitted it and explained it in a thoroughly sympathetic way. But murder said M.R.S. Hubbard. She was tempted by that fine diamond in Patricia Lane's ring. It was foolish of her because it suggested at once that she was used to handling precious stones that business of prizing the diamond out and replacing it with a zircon. Yes, that certainly gave me ideas about Valerie Hobhouse. She was clever, though, when I taxed her with inspiring Celia. She admitted it and explained it in a thoroughly sympathetic way. But murder, said M.R.S. Hubbard. We aren't in a position to charge her with the murder of Celia Austin yet, he said. We've got her cold on the smuggling, of course. No difficulties about that. But the murder charge is more tricky. The public prosecutor doesn't see his way. There's motive, of course, and opportunity. She probably knew all about the bet and Nigel's possession of morphia, but there's no real evidence, and there are the two other deaths to take into account. She could have poisoned MRS. Nicolati's all right but on the other hand, she definitely did not kill Patricia Lane. Actually she's about the only person who's completely in the clear. Geronimo says positively that she left the house at six o'clock. He sticks to that. I don't know whether she bribed him no, said Poirot, shaking his head. She did not bribe him. And we've the evidence of the chemist at the corner of the road. He knows her quite well and he sticks to it that she came in at five minutes past six and bought face powder and aspirin and used the telephone. She left his shop at quarter past six and took a taxi from the rank outside. Poirot sat up in his chair. But that, he said, is magnificent it is just what we want. What on earth do you mean? I mean that she actually telephoned from the box at the chemist's shop. Inspector Sharp looked at him in an exasperated fashion. Now, see here, Mr. Poirot. Let's take the known facts. 
At 8 minutes past 6, Patricia Lane is alive and telephoning to the police station from this room. You agree to that? I do not think she was telephoning from this room. Well then, from the hall downstairs. Not from the hall either. Inspector Sharp sighed. I suppose you don't deny that a call was put through to the police station? You don't think that I and my sergeant and police constable Nye, and Nigel Chapman were the victims of mass hallucination? Assuredly not. A call was put through to you. I should say at a guess that it was put through from the public call box at the chemist's on the corner. Inspector Sharp's jaw dropped for a moment. You mean that Valerie Hobhouse put through that call? That she pretended to speak as Patricia Lane, and that Patricia Lane was already dead. That is what I mean, yes. The inspector was silent for a moment, then he brew it down his fist with a crash on the table. I don't believe it. The voice I heard it myself you heard it, yes. A girl's voice breathless, agitated. But you didn't know Patricia Lane's voice well enough to say definitely that it was her voice. I didn't, perhaps. But it was Nigel Chapman who actually took the call. You can't tell me that Nigel Chapman could be deceived. It isn't so easy to disguise a voice over the telephone, or to counterfeit somebody else's voice. Nigel Chapman would have known if it wasn't Pat's voice speaking. Yes, said Poirot. Nigel Chapman would have known. Nigel Chapman knew quite well that it wasn't Patricia. Who should know better than he, since he had killed her with a blow on the back of the head only a short while before. It was a moment or two before the inspector recovered his voice. Nigel Chapman would have known. Nigel Chapman knew quite well that it wasn't Patricia. Who should know better than he? since he had killed her with a blow on the back of the head only a short while before. It was a moment or two before the inspector recovered his voice. Who has the shallow brilliant intellect to plan, and the audacity to carry out fraud and murder? Nigel Chapman Who do we know to be both ruthless and vain? Nigel Chapman He has all the hallmarks of the killer, the overweening vanity, the spitefulness, the growing recklessness that led him to draw attention to himself in every conceivable way commissing the green ink in a stupendous double bluff, and finally overreaching himself by the silly deliberate mistake of putting Len Battison's hairs in Patricia's fingers, oblivious of the fact that as Patricia was struck down from behind, she could not possibly have grasped her assailant by the hair. They are like that, these murderers carried away by their own egoism, by their admiration of their own cleverness, relying on their charm for he has charm, this Nigel he has all the charm of a spoiled child who has never grown up, who never will grow up who sees only one thing, himself, and what he wants. But why, Mr. Poirot? Why murder? Celia Austin, perhaps, but why Patricia Lane? That, said Poirot, we have got to find out. I haven't seen you for a long time, said old Mr. Endicott to Hercule Poirot. He peered at the other keenly. It's very nice of you to drop in. Not really, said Hercule Poirot. I want something. Well, as you know, I'm deeply in your debt. You cleared up that nasty Abamethy business for me. I am surprised really to find you here. I thought you had retired. The old lawyer smiled grimly. His firm was a most respectable and old established one. I came in specially today to see a very old client. I still attend to the affairs of one or two old friends. Sir Arthur Stanley was an old friend and client, was he not? Yes. We've undertaken all his legal work since he was quite a young man. A very brilliant man, Poirot quite an exceptional brain. His death was announced on the six o'clock news yesterday, I believe. Yes. The funeral's on Friday. He's been ailing some time. A malignant growth, I understand. 
Lady Stanley died some years ago. Two and a half years ago, roughly. The keen eyes below the bushy brows looked sharply at Poirot. How did she die? The lawyer replied promptly. Overdose of sleeping stuff. Medinal as far as remember. There was an inquest. Yes. The verdict was that she took it accidentally. Did she? Mr. Endicott was silent for a moment. I won't insult you, he said. I've no doubt you've got a good reason for asking. Medinal's a rather dangerous drug, I understand, because there's not a big margin between an effective dose and a lethal one. If the patient gets drowsy and forgets she's taken a dose and takes another well, it can have a fatal result. Poirot nodded. Is that what she did? Presumably. There was no suggestion of suicide, or suicidal tendencies. And no suggestion of anything else. Again that keen glance was shot at him. Her husband gave evidence. And what did he say? He made it clear that she did sometimes got confused after COMT aching her nightly dose and ask for another. Was he lying? Really, Poirot, what an outrageous question. Confused after COMT aching her nightly dose and ask for another. Was he lying? Really, Poirot, what an outrageous question. I suggest, my friend, that you know very well. But for the moment I will not embarrass you by asking you what you know. Instead I will ask you for an opinion. The opinion of one man about another. Was Arthur Stanley the kind of man who would do away with his wife if he wanted to marry another woman? Mr. Endicott jumped as though he had been stung by a wasp. Preposterous, he said angrily. Quite preposterous. And there was no other woman. Stanley was devoted to his wife. Yes, said Poirot. I thought so. And now I will come to the purpose of my call upon you. You are the solicitors who drew up Arthur Stanley's will. You are, perhaps, his executor. That is so. Arthur Stanley had a son. The son quaffled with his father at the time of his mother's death quarreled with him and left home. He even went so far as to change his name. That I did not know. What's he calling himself? We shall come to that. Before we do I am going to make an assumption. If I am right, perhaps you will admit the fact. I think that Arthur Stanley left a sealed letter with you, a letter to be opened under certain circumstances or after his death. Really? Poirot. In the Middle Ages you would certainly have been burnt at the stake. How you can possibly know the things you do? I am right then. I think there was an alternative in the letter. Its contents were either to be destroyed come or you were to take a certain course of action. He paused. The other did not speak. Bond you. Said Poirot, with alarm. You have not at Reedy destroyed was he broke off in relief as Mr. Endicott slowly shook his head in negation. We never act in haste, he said reprovingly. I have to make full inquiries to satisfy myself absolutely he paused. This matter, he said severely, is highly confidential. Even to you, Poirot he shook his head. And if I show you good cause why you should speak. That is up to you. I cannot conceive how you can possibly know anything at all that is relevant to the matter we are discussing. I do not know comms I have to guess. If I guess correctly was H-I-G-W-Y unlikely, said M-R. Endicott with a wave of his hand. Poirot drew a deep breath. Very well then. It is in my mind that your instructions are as follows. In the event of Sir Arthur's death, you are to trace his son, Nigel, to ascertain where he is living and how he is living and particularly whether he is or has been engaged in any criminal activity whatsoever. This time Mr. Endicott's impregnable legal calm was really shattered. 
he uttered an exclamation such as few had ever heard from his EPS. Since you appear to be in full possession of the facts, he said, I'll tell you anything you want to know. I gather you've come across young Nigel in the course of your professional activities. What's the young devil been up to? I think the story goes as follows. After he left home he changed his name, telling anyone who was interested that he had to do so as a condition of a legacy. He then fell in with some people who were running a smuggling racket rugs and jewels. I think it was due to him that the racket assumed its final form an exceedingly clever one involving the using of innocent bona fide students. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.